Now, we study the Bible because we believe it is for us complete truth. It is completely inerrant in the original autographs. It's accurate for our lives today. It is God's story of himself and our story of how it can be changed in these pages. We do not equate the Bible with other religious literature. We place the Bible here. Everything else is, is a second or third ram. The Bible and here. So we make no apologies for that whatsoever. That's why we study the Bible here and not other pieces of literature. And we just want to let you know that. We make no apology for looking at these churches the way we're going to look at them today. This is a letter, by the way, that was written to a church that was not rebuked. All other seven churches get a rebuke, except for Philadelphia, um, so there's two. Uh, five churches get rebuked, two churches get encouraged. This is one of those churches. So um, strap in, here we go. Revelation 2.7 says this, And to the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, stop. Just stop right there. This is important. And to the angel of the church... We're talking about Jesus Christ writing to the churches. And he's writing to this church. He's writing to Smyrna. Last week, uh, Matt looked at uh, the church of Ephesus. Important city in that day. Today we're going to go 35 miles north to Smyrna. Let's see, what would 35 miles from here be? Um, maybe uh, the middle of Colorado Springs, um, maybe just touching south of Denver. So you can get um, a little bit of a picture that we're not talking about a huge distance, but in those days, of course, uh, with no electric cars, um, no Teslas around, uh, none of that, it would take a little bit of time to go through the hills uh, and the woods and the brambles to grandmother's house we go. So 35 miles is what separates these two places. Not a lot of land. And here's a map so you can see where Smyrna is on the coast of what is today Turkey. In fact, what sits where Smyrna was is now the um, city of Izmir, Turkey. I don't know if anyone's been to Turkey. It's quite a country, but right there on the seacoast of Turkey is Izmir, and that's where Smyrna was. And this was a breathtaking city. It was gorgeous. It was an absolutely wonderful place to be. Smyrna rose up around 1000 BC, and it had a really good run in the history, uh, but was destroyed by the Lydians around 600 BC. So for 400 years, imagine you're having your town, you got it all just the way you want it, you got the supermarkets where you want it, and the schools and the parks and everything else, and then someone leaves the back door open and the Lydians come in and crush the place. They burn it. They sack it. They absolutely destroy anything that looked like Smyrna. And it stayed that way in 600 B.C. for 300 years until Licinius, who I know you studied so much in history, he was a general under Alexander the Great and a very well-known general. He was well-respected. Well, he kind of came up with the idea, hey, this is an important place. Why don't we put a master plan community in there? So they called the Irvine Company and the same guys that built Highlands Ranch, and they put a master planned community in there. I mean, this thing was thought out from A to B to C to D and all the way to Z. Smyrna had it going, and everybody thought it was gorgeous. So here's a slide of what we think it might have looked like. I saw a lot of different slides, and I, I chose this one. Now, another guy I know that you spend a lot of time thinking about, his name was Strabo. Now, Strabo was a Greek geographer, and he spoke of the handsomeness of the streets. Now, I've, had, I've never had anybody say, wow, that's a, that's a handsome street. I wish my street, by the, the streets around my house, by the way, it could use some handsomeness, but these streets were handsome. And uh, they were built with real ex excellence, with, and there were great rectangular blocks all over town, which this place was built with. The most famous of all was called, get this, the Streets of Gold, which began with the, 
began at the temple of Zeus and ended at the temple of Cybele, and it ran across the foothills that, that kind of the city was built in a bowl there, um, and kind of at an angle, and if the buildings which encircled the town were the crown of Smyrna, the street of gold was like a necklace hanging around its neck. This place was just absolute. I mean, you would sell your Castle Rock home, and we know people who can help you with that, and you would want to move to Smyrna. You, you would do it today if this kind of city existed. That's the kind of place that Jesus is writing to, Smyrna. Now, the name Smyrna comes from the word in the, I, in the Ionic Greek for myrrh. Now, myrrh comes from the Kamifora tree, still found, oh, puberty came back, still found and used today. Myrrh is still an item that folks use all over the world today. Now, how many of you use essential oil? Come on. Oh, you do? You're the first man that I've seen raise his hand. We want to talk to you afterwards. Okay, so you use essential oil. Okay, great. So if you use essential oil, you can have an essential oil of myrrh. Did you know that? You need to run out and get some. Because myrrh was also very expensive in its day. Myrrh was the kind of product that at one point was more, had more weight to it per ounce for expense than gold did. So myrrh was worth having. This is the same spice that the wise men gave to Jesus as a gift. Now, and we're going to talk about that. And here's how you get it. It's extracted from this camaphora tree after the bark is pierced. And this is going to be important later on. So they put spiky things into the bark, and they, they let the resin drain out so, and harden, and then I'll tell you what they do with it after that. There's several uses for it. Number one, medicine. It would be used as a medicine to deaden pain. And we believe this is why Jesus rejected the vinegar myrrh sponge that was held up to him on the cross, that the soldier held up to Jesus when he said, I thirst. Well, he rejected that. Why did he reject it? Because he wanted to take the pain completely for you and me. He did not want to have any of his senses deadened to the process of, cru of crucifixion that he was going through. So that's one use in medicine is to deaden pain. Another was this, is perfume. Myrrh is used as a perfume. In Esther chapter 2, she bathed in this stuff before she went before the king for six months. Now that's why we're asking you to buy some more myrrh, take it home, pour it in your bathtub, and see after six months what you come out, A, looking like, and B, smelling like. It's going to be pretty good. Esther thought it was good. And that was the last big set of baths that she took before she went with her request before the king. So you can read about that in Esther chapter 2. It was, a, it was so costly. It was, it was so highly thought of. And, and lastly, we know that it was used for embalming, to preserve a body before it was put into the tomb or placed into the ground. Now, there was only two ways that the power of myrrh can be unleashed. That's through burning and crushing. And that's what this town was named after. Jesus says, I'm going to write to you. I have something I want to say to you. So keep reading. The words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Jesus Christ is talking about his life. Compared to Smyrna, which had been destroyed and brought back to life, Jesus said, yeah, but I really died and I really did come back to life. Do you see the comparisons that he's just giving this town here? He identifies with them completely as their Savior and their Messiah. The phrase, the first and the last, is a claim to deity. In Isaiah 44, 6, 
we read, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and His Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. All through Scripture, when you see this phrase, first and last, Alpha, Omega, these are claims to deity. This is what makes Jesus Christ unique among all other religious leaders in the world. Only he was killed and died and came back to life. So here he's identifying with Smyrna. You were crushed. You were rubble. And you were named after a spice that I took on me even as a baby, and then later when they laid me in a tomb, listen, I, I get it with what you're going through and what you're experiencing. So Jesus is writing to this church, and just like their city had been rendered lifeless and crushed, Jesus Christ gets it, and he tells them that he gets it. And he gets it about you and me. He knows every experience we have had in life, are having in life, and will have in life. He understands the pressure you're going through. He understands the difficulties that you're up against. He understands. And there are times of doubt in our life when we say, well, where's God? Well, he's right where he was all the time. For the believer in Christ, he was right there with you. And he's writing to these believers in Smyrna these things. Look at verse 9. I know of your tribulation and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say that they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Though they are poor, Jesus says they are spiritually rich. So why were they poor? Well, we're going to come to find out that these folks had some real live persecution happening in their first century city. For the believers in Christ, this was a hostile crowd and town that they were living in. And he says um, that they're rich. Well, an allusion to directly that although you're poor financially, really spiritually you're very rich. You're going through these things, but you're rich people because you are. And Jesus mentions tribulation. Now, this is the Greek word, thalipsis. You can all say thalipsis. It's a fun word to say, thalipsis. But it means tribulation. And the definition of tribulation is this, to crush, to press together, to squash, to compress, to squeeze, just like their town had been. Now they are. It's the same process of putting grapes and, and olives and even wheat together in a process where they would have thalipsis. They would crush it to get out the, the further grain or to get out the further oils from the oils uh, that existed in olives and grain. Absolutely destroy it. Pulverize it. He says, that's what's happening to you. You're going through Philip says, and by the way, I know all about it. See, we often feel like God is so distant from us, don't we? In hard, hard times, God, where are you? He says, I'm just like I was with the church at Smyrna. I'm right, I'm right there with you. I understand what you're going through. This word is used 45 times in the New Testament. And this is not a mild discomfort for persecution. It's interesting, the things that we call persecution really aren't. This is an external pressure being placed upon them. The English word is from the Latin tribulum, the roller that was used by Romans to grind wheat and olives and grapes and to crush it. In ancient England, those who willfully refused to plead guilty had heavy weights placed on their chest and were, were pressed and crushed to death with these weights pressed upon them. That was a thalipsis moment. Thalipsis pictures one being crushed by intense pressure, difficult circumstances, suffering or, or trouble that comes upon them. There is a thalipsis that is emotional. 
Have you not felt some thalipsis this past year? Have you not felt like with all the change that's been going on, there's just not one more thing I can take. There's a, a moment of just feeling the news is so bad. Every day I turn the news on. Every day it's wicked. Every day it's evil. Every day it seems like we're losing. Every day we're giving things up. A thalipsis. It's no, there's no doubt that the rate of suicide has increased. There's no doubt that that rate of suicide has increased with the young Young people who, uh, who feel it at, at 13 and 14, I just don't have another reason to live because it's never going to get better and things are never going to change. And I hear all these promises and finally I, I would just be better dead. Maybe you've reached a thalipsis moment. Maybe through the loss of someone and you feel crushed, you feel burdened. Maybe it's been the decision-making or poor decision-making that some of your children and grandchildren have made. So you kind of feel like, God, I did, I did my best and still my best wasn't good enough and I just feel weighted down. These people were having that kind of thing going on in Smyrna. In Scripture, Thalipsis is most often used about outward Although, as I said, it can be inward. Now, the same process of crushing was used with myrrh to release its fragrance and its medicinal ability. So in order to get fragrance, in order to get the medicine, guess what? Something had to be crushed. And you're going, well, it's okay for him to be crushed. I don't want to be crushed. You know, I, I pick him to be crushed because he's a big guy. Or I, I pick them back there. They're... They're a stronger family than we are. They, they can be crushed for us. And we often depersonalize the tribulation and or the persecution, rather, that's coming toward us. We want to deny in our culture today, as believers here in North America, that anything like physical persecution could ever happen here. Really? You have not been paying attention then to how much things have been changing in our own dear country, and I love this country, the last 20 years. In 2000, I would not have been able to imagine that all of the things that have changed would have changed by the year 2021. It hasn't been gradual, some of it. Some of it has. It's stunning the rate of change that we've gone through just in the past 18 months. There's a thalipsis going on. Jesus says he knows that these people are facing it and he knows we're facing it. He knows all about it. It's literal persecution. Look at verse 9. I know your tribulation, Philipsis, and your poverty, but you are rich, and the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Well, there's some anger here. In Smyrna, there were a city that was hailed for the worship of the god Roma. So they built this big, beautiful city, and one of the temples that they built there was a temple to honor the empire of Rome. They deified their country. And people were required every year to come and burn what? Myrrh as a sacrifice to their new god, Roma. But the Christians would not. And this is why they were poor. Because unless you participated in these temple rituals, you couldn't buy things. You couldn't work in certain places. You went hungry. Wow, is this starting to sound a little familiar? Because you're a Christian. And you wouldn't burn the myrrh. You only wanted to worship King Jesus. So because you wanted to worship only Him... That bread you see on the shelf there, that's not for you. And there was real persecution going on. Satan, the father of lies here, Jesus calls out. This is not a respectful thing Jesus is doing. 
He has no respect for the enemy because he knows he's defeated, number one. And number two, he knows how evil he is. The father of lies. See, here's what the father of lies will do. He will take things that are good and he will have other people call them bad and he will take the bad and have people call them good. Not that we know that that happens anywhere today. Painting error is truth. Christians here were held as responsible for fires, for theft, they were the ones who were blamed for every crime imaginable, even cannibalism, because they took communion. And that's the body and the blood of Jesus as a representation. So they were being slandered. Do you like having bad things said about you? I, I don't like having bad things said about me. You know, someone accused me of being a, a fan of another baseball team yesterday. I didn't, I didn't like that. Because I'm not. There are no sports worth rooting for east of the Mississippi, and that's always been my stand. But I will tell you, we have a lot to talk about. You can, you can boo me all day long. See, slanderer. <laughs> and here's the point. Nobody likes having their reputation bandied about that way. No one. And, and, and these Christians didn't. And now it's costing them their livelihood, their ability to live right, to raise their children right, eat, sleep, work. Jesus says, I know. I know what's going on. He's paying attention. He knows what's happening. And now he says, do not fear what you're about to suffer. Behold, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested for 10 days. And, and for 10 days you will have tribulation. Well, Jesus, I thought, you, I thought you loved us so much that you wanted to prevent us from suffering. No. He never talks about preventing the suffering. He tells them clearly you're going to suffer. You're going to suffer. There's going to be a pressing. There's going to be a crushing. There's going to be a piercing. There's going to be a burning. And, and it's true. It's only going to last for 10 days. This may be a literal 10 days, or it may be the 10 uh, Roman, uh, Roman uh, Caesars that are to come. It may be the fact that it was just a short time, and that's what I take it as. Whenever numbers like this are used in Scripture, it's generally around a shorter period of time. So you're going to suffer. You will be tested. None of us likes to be tested this way. None of us wants to go through what he is describing here. None of us do. And it's interesting that he, call, that he now changes from calling Satan by his name, Satan, to devil, which really is a term that denigrates him even more because it's talking about deceit. See, because that's how the enemy works. And some of us have been wondering, well, why, why is all the division going on right now? Oh, Satan loves division. He wants to divide husband from wife. He wants to divide uh, believers and churches from one another. He wants to divide you politically. He wants to divide you economically. He wants to divide you every way possible because he knows when that happens, there's confusion. And that's what he's the author of. So while he's stirring up the pot with these so-called Jews in Smyrna, he's creating all this chaos. So here comes Jesus talking to Smyrna. He goes, I, I know what you're going through, and you know it's going to be a short time in prison, but that's where you're headed. So if you woke up this morning and Jesus clearly told you, you know, today you need to check yourself into the Douglas County um, uh, jail down here, um, would, is that something you'd be looking forward to? No, none of us would. But it's what he's telling them. We need to pay attention here. We need to pay close attention here. 
Because now we're going to get to two takeaways before we close this morning. And the first is this. This is how we face persecution. Do not fear. Now this is easier said than done. Suffering for Christ is not an option. It is so easy for me to stand up here this morning and say that. Because I'm not being threatened by anybody in the room. But what if I was? Would I, would I be so brave to stand up here and say, stand for Christ and take a stand for him and he will be the victor in the end? Ladies and gentlemen, not of the jury, we will suffer physical persecution. I don't know when, but we will. We are in a bubble to think otherwise. We are deluding ourselves to think otherwise. Consider this, what Paul wrote in his last letter to young Timothy. He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, what, what does it say? Will be persecuted. This isn't a maybe. This is a definite. This isn't, well, we can avoid physical persecution. No, this, this is the real, this is a troubling, troubling, troubling passage. This doesn't say if you serve more donuts on Sunday morning, people are going to like you. Man, you could up it. You could go to Krispy Kreme. You, you could make the best phenomenal donuts on the planet. You could go to the most expensive donut shops. I saw, I think the most expensive donut I ever bought was in uh, Portland, Oregon, for $4.50 a donut. But it had bacon. Doesn't matter. You can, you can do all kinds of trickery to have people like you. In the end, this verse stands. All who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. This is a surety. I have the word all circled in my Bible. That means, Galen back here, to every person in this room, Every person in this room who knows and claims the Lord Jesus Christ by faith, who are living godly, will suffer persecution. Well, you're thinking, well, I can avoid it if I don't live godly. Yeah, but you have to talk to Jesus about that. Will suffer persecution. While I have the day and while I have the life about me, this is a very difficult message, but a very timely message for us to hear today. Because we still have the freedom to process what it is that we're hearing. In many countries that are persecuted, and by the way, that's 351 million people globally that are under persecution today. They might only have a page of the Bible and they memorize it. They might only have a page. They might only have a half a page, but they memorize it. They pull it out. They have reverence for it. You and I can have six or seven Bibles in our house that we never open, even as believers. You know this verse? I hide God's word in my heart that I might not sin against him. Hide it. Treasure it. Mull it over. Because in a day of persecution, you're going to need it. He says, don't fear. Don't fear. It was in the, in the, uh, in the early 70s. As a college student, I was at a college Bible study, and this older lady walked in, and she started telling us about what her family went through during the Holocaust. And how they hid Jews in their home. And they weren't Jewish themselves. But how they hid Jewish people in closets and underneath the floors in their home. And how she lost her family. And she was saying that in such a gracious, 
kind way. And how she and her sister Betsy went to the Ravensbrook camp. Oh, I, I can see that moment like it's right now. I never forgotten meeting her. And there was about 30 of us in the room. And she came and she spoke to our college ministry. Well, she has a quote that I just love, and she says this. In order to realize the worth of anchor, we need to feel the stress of the storm. Do you know what persecution drives out of you? It drives everything out of you. Suddenly, whether you're going to buy a new car or not isn't the big issue. Suddenly, whether there's enough money in the IRA isn't an issue. Is, does your faith in Jesus mean so much to you that in hard times you're willing to let him be your anchor and hold on to him in a storm that is just absolutely horrific? For Corey Ten Boom... He was. Lately, I've been reading more Holocaust stories. I, I just can't get enough of them. I go back and I try to find every Holocaust story I can get my hands on. Why? Because those ladies and gentlemen went through something that I'm about to go through, and I want to figure out how in the world they did it. Because that's going to be me. These aren't some quaint stories that come out of the 1940s. Put that aside. That's what the enemy wants you to think. Ah, oh, that's just historical stuff that happened back then. No, it's stuff that's going on right now. This year alone, 7,000 Nigerians have been slaughtered, Christians. Whole whole. Classrooms full of school children. Imagine your school children, your children of school age, going to their class and being kidnapped and held for ransom, and they're going to kill at least two or three of them just to make the example they're bloodthirsty, they're evil, and they're bent on destruction. And they're guided by Satan and the other representation of him, which is the devil, the deceiver. Seven thousand this year alone. Well, the government will save you. No, the government. Get off your high horse. Like, no government is going to save you. I don't know what you're drinking. I want some of that. It's not going to happen. It's not happening there. It's not happening in Afghanistan. It's not happening in Iraq. It's not happening in Tajikistan. It's not happening in northern India. It's certainly not happening in Malaysia. And I could go on and on and on. We're living in a bubble. Look beyond the bubble. And don't fear. Do not fear, Jesus said. Don't fear. This is why I said this in my word to you. 365 separate times he says, do not fear. Do not fear. My dear friends, do not fear. You know Jesus Christ by faith. You can hold on to him. He's an anchor that, you can, that is going to take the stress of the storm. You can put your confidence in him. And in tough, hard times, no matter what they are, he will hold firm. Do not fear. Some of the greatest stories from World War II come out of the French resistance. They come out of seven, the mouths of 17, 18, and 19-year-olds who resisted the Nazis even to the point of death. This one young Christian said, you know, it's a sunny day that my life has to end. As she walked to be beheaded. 18 years old. Never be married. Never have kids. Never grow up. Have a wonderful family. But to resist, she gave her life. 
What are you willing to stand for? What am I willing to stand for? I ask myself this question every day now. Am I willing to stand? I saw a quote this week. If you want to save faith, don't stay in the shallow end of life's pool much. You will really never know God because he does not hang out in the shallow end of the pool very much ever. And that's true. If you're hoping to take a, or have as a believer a risk-free life, give up on that. You want a deep life? I hear Christians all the time tell me, well, man, I want to go to a church where the teaching is deep. Great, you're getting it this morning. Learn about martyrdom. I do not have the spiritual gift of martyr. But I want to be ready to be martyred. I want to stand up for Jesus. Polycarp, a disciple of John the Apostle, became the pastor of this church. As a young man, he was being discipled by John. His stand for Christ cost him his life. He was martyred on Saturday, February 23rd, A.D. 155, during the public games. You know what they did during the public games? He wasn't the first one. They get Christians in there. They let the lions go loose, and everybody would cheer while they'd be eaten. Well, that was them. That's not us. Get out of the bubble and stand. When Polycarp was going to his death, they asked him to recant. They asked him, that some stories go that they asked him on three separate occasions. And he said, 80 and six years have I served him and he never did me any injury. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? 86 years old. That's me in 18 years. I'm going to tell you now, I hope I'm found worthy. Wheel my wheelchair out there or my walker or however I'm getting around then and I want to be able to say that to the glory of God and to His glory alone. Do you know what being willing to stand will make you in this day? A hero to your children and your grandchildren when you stand in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Political causes are going away. Quickly. Oh, we might have a decent election every now and then. But I'm telling you, standing for Jesus Christ is the only one with surety that we should be standing for. Are you willing, as Polycarp did and so many after him, to stand for him? By this period of 100 to 360, 16 AD, it's estimated that over 5 million Christians were martyred in some sort for their faith. Five million. That is the population of the state of Colorado. I have to say that to, to give you some, some gravity to, to what was going on then and now. There are over 351 million Christians being persecuted for their faith today. That is the population of our country. Get out of the bubble of your thinking. Yes, it's a nice, beautiful fall day here. We might even have snow Wednesday. Oh, please, we need some moisture. But I'm telling you this, it doesn't matter if you just continue to live as a believer in Christ inside of a bubble, thinking you're just going to be safe in this life. Know Jesus Christ and be willing to stand for Jesus Christ. That's a deep life. That is deepness for you. To be willing to say, I am willing on the testimony of what he has done for me to take a stand for him. And Jesus says, some of you are going to be thrown into prison. He says, secondly, not only don't be afraid, be faithful. Verse 10, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. See, he doesn't say they're coming out of prison in 10 days, does he? He says, be faithful to death. Oh man, we don't want to think about that. Oh, you know what though? They did a survey. I love surveys. One out of one still dies. Crazy, isn't it? I didn't know. 
I didn't know. Of course I knew. I just want to deny it. My dad never made 70. He passed away when he was 69. That's me next year. I think about this kind of thing. Deal with your mortality, but deal with it being faithful. I just want to be faithful to Jesus, whether he gives me 90 years, 80 years, 70 years, or 16. I want to be faithful to Jesus Christ. Tribulation, which is crushing and refining, is coming to the church of Jesus in America, and it's coming sooner than we reckon. When you keep your first love, as Pastor talked about last week, you are ready to be crushed as a beautiful fragrance for him. Paul wrote this to the, to the Corinthian church, so we do not lose heart. Though we're wasting away, because it's a momentary affliction. We don't lose heart. You will have much to fear if your life is not found in Christ. Worse than death. Jesus said, look, don't take the broad path. It's a narrow gate. It's a narrow way. Love me that way. Have that kind of passion for me. See me as the only solution for your life and that of the world. The church at Smyrna stands as a church of warning and example. And here's verse 11. The one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. See, there's a first one. That's what he's talking about with the church at Smyrna. Be faithful to death. But guess what? For those who know Jesus Christ by faith, there's not a second death. And the second death is what we ought to fear more. The second death can separate forever. The second death is eternity. The second death is a difference between seeing those who know and love Jesus Christ by faith and never seeing them again. Oh, Cindy Lopper, she thought she was so cute back in the 80s when she made the statement, I can't wait to get to hell so I can party with all my friends. Oh, dear Cindy. Dear Cindy with the multicolored hair, I hope you repent of that. Because you will not see one person after the second death if you do not know Jesus Christ by faith. Man, my wife and I, we're, we're reading through the book of Revelation together. And as Margie and I read it in, in preparation to stay in this topic that the pastor is taking through, the martyrs, it's always the martyrs, they've got the white robes. They stand out. They've been purified. They're holy. And they live beyond the second death. Do you? Will you? If you do not don't know Jesus Christ by faith, you have no hope for that. For those of us who do, we don't need to fear. And we can be faithful. We all can be that together. This is the Chien family in Vietnam. They were burned out of their home because um, they led a Bible study in a nearby village. Imagine if you had your life group over to your house and after everyone left, the community came over and decided to burn you out. This happens all the time. This is not a singular instance. I don't like leaving this slide on the screen too long. It's hard to look at. That's all they have. And all they have is each other. But they have more. They have the Lord Jesus Christ burning strong in their heart. I want to be like these folks because they'll probably go and, and give the word of God in another place, even after a warning. This happens every day that you and I wake up to a nice breakfast. Every day we turn the heat on in a nice, comfortable home. We're so thankful for that, especially in the winter. Will you pray for the Chien family? They're part of our family. They're part of our church. They know Jesus Christ by faith. And knowing what could happen to them, they still did what they did. 
Do not fear. And be faithful. Live resolute lives in front of your family, in front of your children. Deepen your love for Christ. I love in this in this passage, the middle imperative is used. It's, a, it's, 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 it's like this. Keep on, don't just be faithful, keep on being faithful. Keep on not fearing. Don't stop it. Do it right now. It's the crown of life. No second death. This is why I read from the martyrs. Fox's Book of Martyrs is a great book to have in your library shelf, and it's a great book to have right next to your Bible. Read the stories of the martyrs. Become acquainted with their faith and why they died. And more than that, ask yourself, am I placing my complete faith, my complete trust, my complete confidence in Jesus Christ and in Him alone? Is it Jesus plus nothing? I really want to thank you for allowing me the privilege of even standing here today. This is a privilege to stand here. And there are some messages that Pastor and I don't want to give, and this is kind of like one of those messages. Because we're not perfect. We're in, I'm like the Apostle Paul when he said, I'm the chief among all sinners. Why should I even stand up and proclaim him before anybody? I know this, Jesus Christ has changed my life. And I'm not afraid or ashamed to say so. Guy at a filling station one time was putting gas in his car. I was on the other side of the pump, and the, and the pump must have come loose from his car. And suddenly he let loose, Jesus Christ. And I said, where? Anything to start a conversation with someone to let them know that they just said the most magnificent name in the universe. He does sustain me. He is my crutch. I'm not ashamed to say that I rely upon him for everything in my life. And I hope you feel the same way. I know that many of you do. In the late 70s, a story came to us out of the then existing Soviet Union. As the pastor finished speaking, suddenly the doors to the back of the room burst open and a couple of guys in black suits walked up to the front and regular soldiers in the Russian army filled around the room with their weapons drawn. And they were at every every so often scattered all across the room so that the congregation could not move. The guy comes up to the platform, just like I'm standing here, and he comes up to the pastor, and he takes out his service revolver, and he points it at the pastor's head, and he says, will you this day renounce Jesus Christ? And he said, I will not. He asked him again, he said, do you know what, what we can do to your family? Do you know what? And he pointed to them. Do you, do you know what we can do to them? Will you this day renounce Jesus Christ? He said, I, I will not. As he said this again, something strange began to happen, and the soldiers filled into the seats, put their weapons down. The KGB guy re shouldered his service revolver, and then said this. We're also here to worship. We just wanted to make sure. I was speaking at Hume Lake a few years later, and I told this story. About 800 students were there in the room, and this one gal in faulting English came to me afterward and said, I want to let you know something about the story that you told. That was my uncle. Can you, can you, can you understand this? I think about that story every time I come to church here. 
Every single Sunday, I, th I think, I, I just want to worship with the committed. Are we? We must be. A darker day is coming. I promise it to you. I don't want it to happen. I don't want to encourage it to happen. I don't want to force it to happen. It's just the truth of God's word. Before the end, it gets really dark. You haven't seen darkness yet. You, you, you thought you had. Make me willing. Whether I'm 86, 76, or 6, to stand for Jesus Christ. We just want to make sure we're worshiping with the committed. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the church at Smyrna. Thank you for the example that although they were crushed, they were pierced, they were burned. And Jesus did not promise them a way out of that. He promised he'd be with them through it. Make us worthy, Lord, that when that time comes here, our reliance will be steadfastly on you and on you alone. And as the scripture says, we would see Jesus. If you do not know Jesus Christ by faith today, I pray that you will acknowledge him as the only one who can forgive you for the separation and sin that's in your life. The only one, as you talk with him in your own words, that you would say, I receive you by faith today. What you did on the cross for me is going to stand for all eternity. Be that Jesus to me. Clean me, remake me, remold me so that I may have the privilege of standing for you. Thank you, Father, for this morning. And we pray all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.